and was at Sainsbury Lab in Norwich. Of course, um, most people will know Jonathan, he's a fellow of the Royal Society, member of the National Academy of Sciences, um, and has been really at the forefront of work on plant immunity uh, over the last 35 years, I'm afraid to say, John, if not longer. Um, so, um, so Jonathan's <laughs> going to talk about some unpublished data which has been put up on, on BioArchive, and uh, so we're really delighted to have him uh, with us. So let me share my screen and uh, share Jonathan's screen, and then we can, we can kick off. So let's have a look. Okay, so just coming across to you now, John. Just checking I've got the right screen lined up. Oh, I seem to have been right at the end. Right at the end, yeah. Okay, are we there? Yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks for this opportunity uh, to do this. It's uh, broadcasting from home. It's a new experience for me, but my Virgin Media line <coughs> um, handles it adequately. Um, yes, I've only been working on plant immunity for 31 and a half years, not quite 35. came back in uh, uh, September 88 to, to start my lab at the Sainsbury Lab in Norwich. And um, I think it's pretty self-evident that plant immunity, plant disease resistance uh, is socially as well as scientifically uh, important. We like to reduce losses to disease. But in order to accomplish that, we need to understand uh, the biological mechanisms. So um, I've, got, I've got a wonderful team of colleagues uh, at my lab at the St. Uh, these days, it's basically half uh, or so working on basic mechanisms of immunity, particularly triggered by um, or mediated by uh, uh, NLR proteins, intracellular receptors, and then uh, up the other half on, on slightly more applied projects, uh, achieving um, uh, resistance to late blight potato uh, and um, getting there by trying to knock in genes at defined locations. So this title <coughs> means something to uh, some of you out there. Uh, if it doesn't, then it will by the end, I hope. Uh, <coughs> so about um, 15 years ago or so, I started representing what we knew about plant immunity uh, in terms of this sort of so-called Z scheme. Um, now, actually, the inspiration for this representation was photosynthesis. So in photosynthesis, you've got photosystem one and photosystem two and photosystem one. Biolite elevates the energy and electrons up a bit, uh, and then it decays down a bit, and then photosystem two gets it up a bit higher, and that can go off and do work like making ATP and NADPH. That drives uh, sugar uh, accumulation in plants that we all depend on. So <clears throat> this uh, representation uh, uh, is about uh, activation of defense upon recognition of indispensable and relatively conserved pathogen molecules, and then upon recognition of uh, uh, more specific pathogen molecules uh, these days we speak of as effectors. But it's a quantitative increase in defense upon recognition uh, and defense activation. So what was life, life like before the zigzag zig? It's hard to imagine, I know. Um, <clears> the <throat> things were different in the 90s. You had these geneticists studying plant immunity and had these biochemists holding study plant immunity and they didn't really talk to each other. So you had the gene for gene guys, the resistance gene guys. I've got this little screenshot here as a exemplification of a big body of literature uh, on uh, that, that um, specification of the outcome of a plant pathogen interaction by, by genes. And the presumption was that there'd be receptors in plants that recognize specific so-called avirulence genes in pathogens. But you know, nothing was known, none were cloned back in 1990. And in parallel, um, there was a, a, a strong body of work. Uh, the Harlbrock lab were, were, were leaders in it at the, uh, the MPIZ back then. <coughs> um, and uh, there's a lot of work studying the responses to so-called elicitors from pathogens. So there's an oligopeptide elicitor, PET13, defined from um, Phytophthora megasperma, it's actually a fragment uh, of a transglutaminase, and it activates in cultured parsley cells, which I'm also telling system to study in defense, um, a bunch of responses. So there's gene activation, uh, uh, there's uh, um, active oxygen production and, and, and a bunch of other responses that these guys were studying. And uh, Chris Lamb and his colleagues had a similar kind of endeavor with, a, with a, an oligogalacturinide uh, oligo elicitor. Uh, 
<coughs> and they and they highlighted the Oxted invert as a key component of that defense. And you'll see some familiar names. Uh, Jeff Dang was a postdoc in the Harbot lab uh, uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, and so on. Ken Shirasu was a postdoc in Chris Lamb. Um, meanwhile, in parallel, we cloned a bunch of genes for uh, gene for gene resistance, and uh, there was a review that we wrote on molecular genetics of it. But really, <clears throat> still at that stage, back in '95, that was didn't intersect with all these uh, studies on on defense responses triggered by elicitors. So um, around the, I at that time and my colleagues over 25 years ago, through this 1994, cloned a, a gene called uh, CF9 from tomato pose resistance to this uh, pathogen cladosporium full leaf mold and it recognizes a secreted um, uh, apoplastic effector from the pathogen called AVR9. And it was the first, it was a pioneer member of this receptor-like protein class of cell surface receptors uh, and um, you know I was very interested actually not just in cloning these genes but figured out figuring out what they did and so uh, we recovered a review with Kim Hammond Kozak, resistance gene dependent plant defense responses. But it occurred to me that I couldn't really figure out how our genes or our proteins did what they did without actually documenting what they did. So uh, how do resistance genes do what they do? What, what do they do? So we had a look at what they did. And, and the nice thing about this resistance gene was that um, you could supply an apoplastic effector, or AVR9, and look at the responses. So guess what? We saw the same things the Harbrock lab and the Lamb lab had been seeing uh, uh, years before. You see rapid, rapid production of active oxygen species, activation of MAP kinases, <laughs> um, a bunch of genes are induced. And then we did uh, with Viggs, uh, it, we investigated the um, contribution these made to the response. So in fact, we cloned the first uh, receptor-like cytoplasmic kinase, ASIC1, that was shown to be required for the action of a cell surface receptor. Um, and um, we, we to, to, to bring together the resistance gene field, however, and the uh, cell surface receptor uh, immune uh, defense response field, the, the key breakthrough came from um, Thomas Boller's lab. Uh, Thomas Boller was another of the researchers who was investigating uh, uh, responses to extracellular elicitors, um, and he uh, defined protein elicitors that activated responses in many plants, including Arabidopsis. And using genetics, he and his colleagues identified a gene called FLS2, a leucine rich receptor like kinase involved in the perception of uh, uh, flagellin. And I should say that the molecules, uh, the receptors for the, for the um, uh, elicitors studied by the Halbrock lab still um, haven't been defined, to my knowledge. Um, and then another receptor was uh, were cloned, uh, Cyril Zipfel's PhD work, uh, the uh, EFT re uh, receptor um, in Arabidopsis EFR, another leucine which repeat receptor kinases, kinase. And um, with these tools in hand and, and more genetics, uh, a, a uh, very detailed picture has emerged from uh, Zipfel lab, many other labs, of the chain of events and the protein components required and what they do with each other in, in so-called pattern-triggered immunity. Pattern-triggered immunity, micro, microbial pattern-mediated uh, immunity, MAMPT, uh, MTI, some people like to call it. Um, I usually call it PTI, though in fact I think we should just call it surface receptor-mediated immunity. And we know a lot about the defense mechanisms that are activated uh, by it, and it's the usual suspects. Active oxygen species, a bunch of genes are induced, uh, protein kinases are involved in that regulation. Um, so uh, back to where I came in, you know, the zigzag zig. Um, the the uh, the question arose, you know, what is the relationship between what resistance proteins do that are recognizing molecules from pathogens encoded by virulence genes, um, and uh, the relationship between that and the PTI pattern triggered immunity or pattern triggered immunity. Uh, that have been studied for a long time, uh, often in cell cultures. And this, this representation here, is, uh, like I say, it's where I came in. It's got the additional twist that some pathogen effectors may be suppressing uh, effector triggered immunity, and there's certainly a few that do that, or most of them, I would say, don't. Um, and that could trigger an additional uh, um, uh, zig. <laughs> um, we aren't the only people to start using this language here. Uh, I should. Knowledge the Staskovitz lab, they also came up 
the so-called um, uh, effective triggered immunity and PAMP triggered immunity. Uh, and usually when I talk about it these days, I, I just talk about it in terms of a cartoon because this sort of this this uh, this um, zigzag zig is a bit cryptic. The bottom line is we've got cell surface receptor mediated immunity and intracellular receptor mediated immunity. Uh, and sometimes I'm quite like to talk about it as Sermi and Ermi, uh, but I don't know if it'll catch on. Um, <clears throat> so this does beg the question though: What is effective triggered immunity? What is it actually doing? Uh, and we don't really know very well um, because when people study ETI and say that they're studying ETI, they're very rarely studying it in the absence of PTI. So if we infiltrate Pseudomonas syringae or some uh, disabled uh, strain that only in, 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 <coughs> delivers the effect that you're interested in, then you are delivering Pseudomonas and its sort of um, cocktail of PAMPs in addition to the delivery of the effector. If you do transient assays in Bocomiana, use agro to deliver it, well, you are activating PTI as well as ETI. And in real infections, of course, you're getting PTI as well as ETI, Sermi as well as Ermi. Um, so what do you do to study ETI alone? Because actually, it's not really known what ETI alone does, uh, I would argue. Um, that's what we wanted to do something about. So, so it's illustrated uh, here as an issue. So if you infiltrate WS2 Arabidopsis with a strain of, of um, effector, uh, a stra sorry, strain of Pseudomonas that delivers a, a, a recognized effector, POPP2 is recognized by RPS4 and RS1, after 24 hours you get the cell death response. If you infiltrate a um, mutant POPP2, this C321A mutant, or if you infiltrate a plant that's mutant for the receptor, RS1 in this case, then you can't see anything. But we, we've done, we and published five years ago, six years ago, gene expression profiling. And you can show that if you just infiltrate the pseudomonas that doesn't deliver the effector, you still get some defense response activated. And, and as read by these two genes, cytochrismic synthase and EDS5 involved in salicylate biosynthesis. Um, but you don't get very much. But if you uh, deliver a recognized effector from your pseudomonas, then you get much more activation and defense. So you can see that ETI. Is, is potentiating it. But this, this is, is, uh, um, illustrates again the point I was making earlier that you, what we're, you, in order to study ETI, historically what people have done is to compare PTI plus ETI with PTI alone. Uh, and, and, and later on you see this classic marker of salicylate responses, PR1, coming up uh, very high, and that's perhaps salicylate triggered immunity. Uh, that only comes up after sufficient salicylators accumulated from the action of these two genes and uh, some other genes uh, for uh, PR1 to be induced uh, as a salicylate induced genes. So four hours, six hours, eight hours, you can see the time points here. <laughs> um, and, and there's a bunch of genes that are strongly activated. We're interested in how they're activated because you're back to the question of how do our genes do what they do? Well, the first question you've got to ask is what's the first thing you can see them doing? And the first thing we can see them doing is potentiating uh, gene ex uh, expression. And we're interested in how uh, this complex of uh, two different uh, immune receptors turn on uh, this set of genes. But in order to study ETI alone, uh, what we've done is to adopt an idea that's uh, not our idea, uh, but uh, it's we make the so-called super ETI line, SETI, uh, and with, with an estradiol inducible labia RPS4 gene. So we can infiltrate estradiol uh, without any PAMPs, and we can look for what happens when we activate an RPS4 RS1 dependent detection of AVR RPS4. Uh, the first report of the, using this kind of method was actually from 98, but it wasn't done to use to do plant physiology, it was actually used for genetic screens. So here's a little time course here. This is in a, a, a set E lines, super ETI lines, so we induce AVR RPS4, and then we in, that, it's followed by induction of the responsive genes, that's our RPS4 and RS1 dependent, and then we get the PR1 coming up. So we can investigate what the relationship is between ETI and PTI, um, and uh, we want to know we can look for what is activated by ETI alone. Uh, we can also ask if all ETIs are the same, because we've got estradiol inducible uh, other effectors. Uh, I won't have time to go into that in detail, but that's in the uh, bioarchive papers, which I'm just referring to here. So we um, have been coordinating publication with uh, Xu Fang Jin's group who have uh, discovered something 
rather similar, which is that basically what ETI does is to potentiate uh, the action of PTI. Uh, and, and, and indeed, in their experiments, their tidal plane you know, shows that it's uh, PRRs. Receptors are required for NLR mediated uh, plant immunity. Um, so, what sort of experiments did we do to get at this? So, uh, one here's a simple one. If we induce with estradiol, uh, induce AVRRPS4 before we infect the Pseudomonas syringi, DC3000, we can see a substantial drop in the proliferation of the Pseudomonas during such an infection uh, compared to if we have not uh, uh, induced, which is what we see here. So, inducible expression of the, this effect enhances resistance. You'll notice I haven't referred to any cell death being activated 24 hours later, and I'll come back to that point at the end. If you pre-treat with uh, um, estradiol, then you get a stronger activation of ROS, rectoboxin species, uh, in response to plague 22. So you can see there's a twofold uh, elevation here of the peak, and also cumulatively over here, uh, you're getting uh, um, more rectoboxin produced if you've pre treated uh, with estradiol to induce AVRRPS4. And this uh, it, activation of defense is, uh, sorry, of rectoboxin species is prolonged. So uh, over quite a long time course, you see uh, um, rectoboxin species production where it essentially has gone away if you have not pre treated with estradiol to activate AVRRPS4. And again, here's the uh, summation over the time course. Um, and also we have assays for um, PCI signaling such as um, the immunoblots to the phosphorylated form of MAP kinase and you can see that uh, the MAP kinase activation, although it does go down uh, after 30 minutes or so, is sustained. Uh, it's still there one hour and two hours if you've pre-treated with estradiol but not if you haven't. Um, and also here's um, uh, immunoblots to phosphorylated positions on the uh, RBOHD, uh, and uh, that's the respiratory burst oxidase that makes reactive oxygen species. You can see in particular here greatly elevated um, abundance of the activated form of this if you've pre-treated with estradiol, uh, but not if you haven't. Um, it also, pre-activation with ETI, uh, elevates the abundance of these proteins. So look at this. So if you've pre-treated with estradiol, then you get a lot more signal in your anti-RBOHD antibody and also your anti-BIC1 antibody. BIC1 being another uh, receptor-like cytoplasmic kinase that plays a crucial role, uh, or it's in a family of proteins that play a, a crucial role uh, in, in surface receptor-mediated immunity from FL, um, FLS2 and uh, EFR. Uh, and also, um, co-activation with, now back to co-activation rather than pre-activation with it, with, uh, with estradiol, it, it, it enhances and it prolongs uh, the PTI signaling in response to a pseudomonas mutant that can't deliver any effectors to suppress uh, plant immunity. And so you see uh, six hours and 24 hours here, you're still getting uh, some activation of the MAP kinase where that's basically gone away, uh, especially up to 24 hours completely, uh, if you've not co-delivered um, estradiol. And again, we also see a stronger signal for, for BIC1 if we co-delivered estradiol to induce AVRPS4 uh, and a more prolonged activation of uh, BIC1 uh, in an estradiol-dependent uh, way. Now, if you look at estradiol in, uh, uh, AVRPS4 induction in the absence of any PAMPs, then you don't see any MAP kinase activation at all. Uh, you don't see uh, uh, any activation. Uh, this is the uh, RBOHD. Um, so, so actually, what estradiol AVRRPS4 does, once you've induced it, what ETI through RPS4 and RS1 does, is to elevate the abundance of these protein components, but it doesn't activate. Um, consistent with this, this is now uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, DAB staining to assay hydrogen peroxide accumulation. So a <clears throat> heart C mutant, after two days, you basically don't see any DAB staining, but you would if you'd looked earlier, but it's gone away. Um, but if you pre-treated with estradiol or co-delivered estradiol with your DC3000, you see quite a strong uh, erective option species signal. And uh, if you do it in the context of a, an infection with, or infiltration of bacteria that have um, 
uh, that can deliver effectors, you can see what's going on uh, even more clearly. So we've got immunoblocks to BIT1, RBUHD, phosphorylated form of the MAP kinases and the amount of MAP kinases here. So uh, if you infiltrate the pseudomonas that um, can't deliver effectors, that's a HOC-C mutant, uh, type 3 secretion mutant, and you see uh, uh, these responses. But if you deliver pseudomonas that has a type 3 secretion system and delivers a bunch of effectors, this is now PTI plus ETS, you can see these signals are all reduced. And that's because um, the effectors are attenuating uh, uh, plant defense. But if you've got, uh, uh, if you deliver pseudomonas with estradiol, you see a much stronger, much higher abundance of BIT1, RBOHD, stronger MAP kinase responses uh, and stronger abundance of the MAP kinases. So the way we, this is now sort of the, the you know, why we talk about the zigzag zig going full circle. Um, so <clears throat> your PAMPs activate defense, effectors bring it down. Um, <clears throat> and what goes on with uh, the resistance protein is it restores attenuated uh, pattern triggered immunity. There's one more sort of data point that's kind of interesting here. I mentioned um, the the uh, issue of whether or not you get a hypersensitive response. We thought, great, with an estradiol inducible labia rapis 4, we can study the HR with with, uh, with great detail without the complication of um, bacteria. Guess what? With induced with estradiol, there is no hypersensitive response, with, at least with the labia rapis 4 uh, system. And it, it, this is when we started down this road. In fact, we wondered if what was required for the hypersensitive response was co-delivery of PAPs. And guess what? That's exactly what we found. So if you have, um, uh, if you deliver HRC mutants or FLAG22 or, or a mi mixture of PAMPs or pseudomonas fluorescence, which is not pathogenic, you don't get an HR. If you induce with estradiol, AVRRP4, you, do, you don't get an HR. But if you have both, and it doesn't matter which PAMP it is, um, you get the hypersensitive response, you get the program cell death. And this requires MAP kinase activation. I, there's data on that in the paper, but I don't have time to go through that in detail. So that's why we say mutual potentiation. Uh, so the e PTI is potentiating the HR associated with ETI, and ETI is potentiating uh, PTI. <clears throat> so back to this model, I mean, the zigzag zig model implies that uh, PTI and ETI share the same pathway with ETI activating defense more strongly, but ETI and PTI actually activate different but interacting processes. So, so like I said earlier, ETI elevates the abundance of the PTI component, so you get a stronger uh, PTI. So here's another way of representing it graphically. Pathogens can't help making PAMPs that are, act that are, that are detected through cell surface receptors and you get uh, activation of defense but only competent pathogen worth its salt will deliver effectors that suppress that. However, if the effector is recognized by uh, some NLRs, then it's the, the action of that NLR is to restore uh, PTI by um, elevating the abundance of components uh, and replacing inactivated components with uh, new active components. So ETI elevates the expression of these genes and also probably even more so the, the protein abundance of these proteins. Uh, so I, I don't think it's just transcriptional. But PTI is probably the primary source of resistance. And you should have seen the smile on Cyril Zipper's face when I acknowledged that. Um, and, uh, but ETI restores PTI after effector attenuation or, or negative autoregulation. Um, ETI we know is receptor limited because most resistance genes are actually uh, semi-dominant. So the more you have the merrier, uh, the more you have, the more of this restoration there will be to suppress the action of effectors. And it's very quantitative. There's sort of a tug of war going on. <coughs> um, but uh, what inference, one inference we took from this, if you've got multiple recognitions going on uh, in a plant, uh, uh, and of uh, course there's a lovely bit of work recently published um, out of David Gutman and, and uh, Daryl Laveau's teams, uh, that shows how Arabidopsis non-host resistance to many pseudomonas strains involves multiple uh, uh, NLRs detecting multiple effectors. If you've got a lot of these recognitions going on, you're going to have both a genetic benefit, but also a physiological benefit, because you have a stronger PTI, uh, and, and this could contribute to such non-host resistance. And we've been bringing this over to uh, our work that we're, trying, that, we're, that we're doing to try and come up with a potato 
uh, is has non-host resistance to potato late flight. Uh, and it, it adds to the, the strength of the argument, I think, that LNR gene stacks uh, for, um, in our case, blight resistance, but uh, in other cases, uh, stem rust resistance in wheat or, or anything else. Um, <clears throat> the um, these stacks will have both genetic and physiological benefit, enhancing the stability, the strength of the PCI, making it harder for the pathogen to uh, invent around it. So there you go, that's the basis for uh, me terming this talk, um, plant immunity, the zigzag zig turns full circle. Here's what we'd really like to get to, Solanum americanum, in which we've taken a number of resistance genes, uh, and we'd like to make um, potato as resistant to uh, P. infestans as, as this thing is. Uh, I'd like to thank my great colleagues. I should also add a name I've forgotten to put on here, Asil Zipfel, um, because a lot of the heavy lifting in the work I've talked about is done by Bruno, ably helped by uh, He Kyung and, and Ping Tao. Uh, but uh, Cyril Zipfel has been on Bruno's uh, uh, PhD committee and has made a lot of helpful suggestions as we went along. I'd like to thank the great team I've been associated with uh, and funders, Gatsby Foundation, Fund TSL, European Research Council, various other funders. BBSRC have supported this uh, a lot, and we know the BBSRC uh, DTP student. Um, thanks for your attention. Thanks so much. Give you a sure, it's out there. <laughs> I say th thanks very much, uh, JJ, for that. So we've had a few few questions through. So let me let me send them across to you. If I can't get to everyone's <laughs> question, then um, I will pass them all on to to Jonathan and to <laughs> Jocelyn later. And there you will try and get to answers, and I'll try and publish those when I publish the recording on the Garnet website afterwards. So apologies if you don't get to yours. So the first question from uh, someone called David Volcom, you might be familiar with. So he asks, um, so he asks um, about PTI without a HR induced by viruses, which don't have a PAMP. What happens in those sort of reactions? Well, that's a good, very good question, David. So you're showing a lot of promise there. Um, the, uh, what a, it's clear that the the N gene um, in uh, tobacco for the TMV resistance uh, and a number of other genes uh, um, can uh, activate uh, defense without uh, an apparent PAMP being involved. Although there are reports that some virus components can act and um, trigger the classic PTI. The classic PTI type responses. The extreme resistance that you're um, referring to, um, in, in a way, it's quite consistent with what I'm saying about estradiol inducible behavior after your sport. If, if the NLR works well enough, um, <coughs> it, uh, it can, and we do know that the NLRs, uh, such as uh, RP4, RS1, activate salicylate biosynthesis in addition to um, the creation of PTI. Um, that if salicylate is, acts as an antiviral mechanism, uh, then the um, uh, then you could get uh, resistance without cell death. You can get atten attenuation of viral uh, propagation without cell death. But we can pick this up on Saturday morning when we go for a run. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hopefully, people can still. Yes. Yeah, so um, thanks very much. Uh, so next question from uh, some De from Detlef Feigl. Um, he says, "Can you remind us what ETI looks like in BAC1 mutants, which have much reduced PTI?" Um, in a BAC1, uh, BAC1-5 BKK1 double mutant, um, certainly RP4 RS1 does not work to um, restrict uh, bacterial propagation if it carries a, the recognized effect of ABR after it's And that's part of the argument. Uh, we, we've got a bit of data on that in our paper. There's more such data in Xu Feng's uh, paper. So, um, but I, to be honest, I forget what the outcome was with the respect to HR, you know, if, if, with, with Pseudomonas plus ABR after. I'll, um, I'll, I'll ask Ping Tao and, Brun and Bruno that later and, and let you know. That's great. So, apologies, Joe. I'm having a little bit of uh, connecting here. But um, so, I think a question from Sebastian Feilmeyer, and he asked about 
Um, what degree does the native microbiota play, if that has a role uh, in this response? Uh, I'm sure it does in the real world, but I don't think it does in the experiments um, that we've been conducting. So, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I guess it might be interesting to look at um, whether there are differences in the response if you have estradiol inducible AVRP4 or some of the other inducible effectors we've worked with, uh, uh, comparing completely sterile plants, uh, sterilely grown plants, uh, to plants in which uh, roots and, and uh, leaves have been colonized by microbiota. That's, that's a good, that'd be an interesting experiment to do, and, and we haven't done. Okay. And and just a final question, and so this is a question from uh, Sebastian Snor, and he asks about kind of a control question, really. So, what would be a, the effect of estradiol alone? Does that have any effect on um, on the system where you? So, the, in our experiments, there's no discernible effect to estradiol. Um, so, the negative control that we use is a, net, a construct that carries an estradiol-inducible um, AVRPS4 mutant that is unrecognizable, uh, AVRP is called Kirby. Um, and uh, we basically don't see anything significant happening in that as far as apart from uh, the appearance of a transcript encoding the um, unrecognizable AVRP is called. Okay, that's great. So thanks so much, Jonathan. Right. Okay, so um, we will now move on to our second talk. So John, can you um, 